Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Mosaic Podcast. I've sort of been on a break for a little while. I haven't been doing these, and I really, really missed it. And in coming back, one of the things that never ceases to amaze me is how I can, ha I can meet and have a conversation in a few minutes in a green room, but even before the green room conversation with our guest today, just reading about what he did, it sort of blew my mind how similar the work he's doing and the work I'm doing are. And how, how does that happen? The two complete strangers who've never met each other, never discussed anything, never talked to each other, never even knew each other existed 14 seconds ago, come together and suddenly realize that they're, they're doing similar things in very different ways but they're doing very similar things and, and bringing about a change in the world that is very connected and very alive. And it's such an honor to come back from my little short hiatus of, of podcasting to bring you today a man by the name of Brian Miller. I found Brian on a TEDx talk that he gave that by the way, just happens to have been viewed by 3 million people, um, which is like unbelievable. Uh, he is a magician turned author, speaker. He has his own podcast. Uh, and he's a consultant on human connection. His book called Three New People, publisher was weekly, wrote about it, that it brilliantly outline, outlines a system for deepening relationships. Brian is a light in this world that I'm excited to have you meet. And it's with my pleasure that I say, Brian Miller, welcome to the Mosaic Podcast. Hey, thanks so much for having me. It's a real honor to be here. It's my honor, my friend. Thank you for being here with us. So let's jump in. Um, Brian, what did your parents do? My parents, they did something extraordinary. What they did is <laughs> they gave me a normal life in an abnormal situation. Um, you might have been asking about their professions. I can talk about that a little bit later. But I'm what, asking what, for exactly <laughs> what you answer. <laughs> what, what they did was, so my parents were divorced when I was about a half a year old. I have no memory of them being together. And if you say that to someone today, they're kind of like, yeah, so what? Everybody's parents are divorced, right? But this... And, you know, when that happened to me when I was a kid, that was still at a time where it was incredibly unusual, um, even in the States. And for me, my entire childhood, I was almost guaranteed to be the only kid in, in any room with divorced parents. Everybody's wow. parents were together. And in spite of that, my parents, who had just decided they couldn't be married to each other anymore, they got the courts to allow them to decide the terms of the custody and the divorce on their own without an intervention, which was unheard of at the time. And they amicably on their own figured out how to do everything in their power to make the situation work for me. Everything was meant to work for me. I was only a half a year old at the time. So they figured out how to split my time between the two of them exactly 50%. And until the day I was 18 years old, they lived 10 minutes apart from 15 minutes apart from each other in two slightly different school districts, which created a few issues later in life. But apart from that, I went back and forth on a split schedule. I, there wasn't a, the way they worked out, they're both computer scientists. The way they worked out the math was that every single day they either saw me when I woke up or they saw me when I went to bed. So if I woke up at my dad's, I went to sleep at my mom's or vice versa, no matter what. So they wow. both saw me every day and I split my time 50-50. And if I described my schedule throughout my childhood to most people, it would sound insane, but it's, it's, it was all I ever knew. And it would be really easy for me to play a, I, oh, my parents were divorced and I had this horrible, I had a normal childhood. It didn't seem any different than any of my friends. I never felt different uh, apart from the fact that I knew my parents were separated. But outside of the superficial aspect of that, 
I had a normal childhood in in in, in whatever that that means. Uh, so so when you say what did they do, uh, they did something kind of amazing, really. Yeah. Um, you know, with within that. Uh, as I say though, they they were uh, they are both computer scientists uh, doing both having done truly extraordinary uh, work. My, my mom broke through every glass ceiling as a computer scientist doing practical work and has some very high government clearance doing crazy stuff that she's not allowed to talk about. And um, Well, don't tell me what she did. I don't oh, want I her to have to come I hunt can't. me down and kill me. Right? I can't. No. <laughs> I can't. Um, couldn't tell you if I wanted to. I don't know. I, uh, I, I only know the bare minimum, uh, but then my, my father um, made significant um, contributions uh, to the world. He's, he's actually a world-renowned um, computer scientist. He, he, about 30 years ago, he was on the forefront of bioinformatics, which was taking supercomputing technology and applying it to medicine. And the algorithm he invented to do that um, helped somebody win a Nobel Prize. And then my dad's algorithm was called one of the top 10 algorithms of the 20th century. And so he's wow. been on every who's who list in the world. And I did the obvious thing and became a professional magician. <laughs> so are you how's, that, you, how's that to start the podcast? <laughs> you know what? There's certain questions and it, and it always surprises me that when you ask just a very simple question, like what did your parents do? It sort of sets the tone for every podcast and in some mm -hmm. way or another. It's just, it's just so interesting to me. And it, and it came as a surprise. I never realized it did. But you said something I want to clarify if I can, because sure. at one point as you were starting, you said, you know, my parents were separated when I was half a year old. And it always made me feel a little bit separate because none of my, none of, none of the kids in my, in my community or, or neighborhood or whatever it was, um, had parents that were separated. They all had their parents together. And then a few moments later, you said, but I, ra I was raised in a completely normal situation. Mm. The reason I'm asking is I lost my dad when I was 13 and my mom when I was 15, two years later on the same day. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. And there is nothing that any, like I was not as similar as I was. I mean, I was a jovial guy who was always had a lot of friends. But there was a part of me that never felt like the world could understand me because mm. none of my parents, none of my kids lost their parents. None of them were, were not, they were never divorced because it was so long ago that divorce wasn't even a possibility, right? Sure. But they didn't know what it was like to feel the deepest pain that I felt. And when I wanted to go talk to somebody about it, I couldn't talk to them. They could say nice things but they couldn't know the depth of that. Did that happen for you or was that not the way you, that's where I thought you were going. And then you said, but I had a completely normal child. Yeah. So superficially I had a fairly, you know, I, I, I had a normal childhood. I did all the things that kids do. I, I went to, um, I, I played sports and I played music and, and I was in whatever and my parent, whether whoever's day it was, the other one came to everything. They just went to everything. Um, but I, I not in any way, really, like not to the depth of the loss that you went through, obviously, and going through that as a teenager, I can't even imagine my, my wife's actually a, a, a therapist and um, uh, works with families. She's a family therapist and uh, she deals with that kind of stuff on a day to day. And I, I can't, uh, I can't even imagine because I've never gone through anything like that. Um, but within the context of my my situation, yeah, I always, I mean, I felt like something was different about my life because, you know, I, I, I went back and forth between two very different houses. It was really more, less of a function of the divorce and more of a function of that there were two completely different parental philosophies in the two different houses. I was raised by my dad on one side and he got remarried once or twice and you know some step parents came in and out of my life on the other side but he was the parent on that side and at the other house my mom was remarried by the time i was 2 and my so my stepfather is in all of my memories on uh, and so i have no memories so he he was a parent i kind of had three parents right and my stepfather set all of the rules at the other house and i have my two siblings my brother and sister who are technically half siblings but they've never been anything but my brother and sister to me because my stepfather has been in my life since i have memories right, right, right. so my me and my brother and sister were raised by my stepfather and then i was raised at the other half of my life by my dad 
And my dad was very democratic. He was very liberal. He wanted, uh, not in the political sense, but in the sense of he always wanted to make sure that the rules were agreed to by me and him. He wouldn't just say, this is what it is. He would say, here's what I'm thinking. How do you feel about that? And what would happen is as a result of that, if I ever broke a rule, I was, broken, I was breaking my own rule because right. I had Beautiful. agreed to it. We had worked on it together. Beautiful. But then my stepfather, and this is not to say ill of him, it was just a different approach. He was just kind of the dictator. It was, the, it's because I said so and I'm the parent and that's it. So you got a lot at that side. You had, my brother and sister were really rebellious for a long time and they would break the rules every chance they got. Yeah. Whereas I never broke a rule ever at my dad's because it would have been ridiculous to do it. So less to the extent that my parents were divorced and just more to the fact that I had just these conflicting ideologies, things that were appropriate at one house were totally out of the ordinary at the other house and vice versa. And for most of my childhood, there were also different financial situations of very, which I didn't realize as a kid. And I've apologized to my mom so many times as an adult and she's doing phenomenally well now, but as a kid, she was just scraping it together and trying to make ends meet. And my dad was doing very well for himself in this amazing career at the beginning of this heightened thing he did. So just the disparity between the two households in retrospect really set the tone for my life and my work ethic and my ethos um, navigating totally different perspectives that are equally valid. Yeah, right? totally. Totally. Yeah. So, it's really interesting that you bring it up because one of the things that I believe is the places where we have the most problems are not when our core values go against something we don't believe in because our core values always, I mean, we, we sometimes are lustful or immoral or whatever it is we, we end up doing, but normally our core values and that will win out eventually, right? Yeah. But it's when our core values are in opposition with each other yeah. When we have one core value that says integrity and another core value that says I want to be loved, or when mm -hmm. we have an, one core value that says the rules are the way we live our life and the other core value says, no, it's a democracy. There are no rules unless they're the ones that we make. How did you piece together? How did you connect those two realities? Because you're literally also destabilizing a stable environment, even if it's only 10 or 15 minutes away. You're yeah. living in a different place, in a different room, then going, maybe going to a different, you know, a set of friends, driving to it, yeah. you know, I mean, how did you make peace of that? It's a, it's a, it's, I have a developmentally <laughs> delayed daughter and we were, and she decided she wanted to live in a group home because she wanted to be like with kids like her. Sure. And it broke my heart and we were bringing her back every weekend, but every weekend was too, uh, it was too interruptive for her. So we found out that every other weekend worked and we would keep her from Friday morning till Monday evening. And that yeah. worked, right? But yeah. this going back and forth is how, yeah. how did that, how did that settle you? Yeah. So when I got to around middle school where you start to develop kind of real friend and middle school is kind of hard for everybody. And I have like your archetypal Disney bullied kind of a, uh, you know, story. I was, I was just, you know, I was, the little tiny little wimp that got you know teachers pet they just got books knocked out of my hands and shoved into lockers i had the whole disney channel bullying upbringing wow. but uh um but ha having said that so middle school i i sat my parents down and said this every other day this every day thing isn't working anymore it worked when i was a little kid i said i need longer periods at each house so i started having kind of like three days on, three days at the other, two days, two days, at least there was some con a little bit of consistency. And then I had set them down again when I went to high school and said, I need a week back and forth. Yeah. Um, and, and so I, I, and you know, I would sit them down and tell each one, you know, we all got to have a conversation. This isn't working. And so when, once I got to high school, it was a week at one house and then a week at the other. And, um, and that was just to help me with, I had, to like you said, it was very perceptive. I had totally different friends at each house because I had different neighborhoods and different, and they were different socioeconomic neighborhoods as well. So I had great friends at each place, but they had nothing to do with each other. Yeah. And, um, and so then I also had- minutes yeah. 15 minutes away was like a world away because- Yeah, I mean, they, they were both, they were, it was the, they were both middle class, but it was the difference. But so like, I, there was no poverty in my, my family, right? I, I don't have right. that story and I don't claim it or pretend, but- 
it was the difference between like lower lower middle class and upper middle class yeah. and like you know pushing the boundaries of upper middle class so it, it 15 minutes made a they were both good schools but they were the difference between like the eighth best school in the area and the number one school every year for 50 years in a row. It, wow. it, it was that difference. And it's, it's not a, 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 it's, I'm not telling this as a tragedy, just as a, it's the back and forth that really throws off um, how you deal with day-to-day -day situations and how you see um, problems being dealt with. My dad dealt with issues very differently than the other household dealt with issues which is a product of so many variables. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what I like about it in terms of the work that I do, and I'm assuming the work that you do as well, is so much of what happens is the way we perceive the world defines the world we see. Yeah. And, and when you have the opportunity to have two completely different perceptions of the same world, it has to blow the mind open a little bit to see yeah. other possibilities that exist where most people don't see those. Yeah, I, I think that it's always easy, easy to see this stuff in retrospect, right? Of you can course. never see this stuff in advance, right? You can only <laughs> connect the dots looking backwards. But when you look backwards and you look at that, it seems like an obvious, that's where I learned to have this intuition for other perspectives than my own are equally valid, which is, or, or, at least might be equally valid, right? There is still, there are still facts. Some of oh, us have forgotten that. There are still facts. But within facts are how we decide to integrate those facts into our lives. And that, I think, two people can agree to the same fact and completely disagree about the conclusion of what they should do about it, right? And that's where your beliefs and background and culture and religion and language and ideology matter, and they really matter. And I've, I've learned that as a magician originally, that's what my TEDx talk was about and a, lo a good portion of my book, right? Is that as a magician, what you learn is that not only are you operating from a completely different, almost the opposite point of view of the audience because they're not allowed to know the secret and you, you know all the secrets and you're trying to have a shared experience. But more importantly than that, and this was the real insight, you can only create magic for someone that has a different perspective than you. Because if they had your perspective, you couldn't fool them. You couldn't create yeah. the magic because they'd have the secret. I can't create that experience for another magician. She knows how all the tricks work, right? right, right. So the, the insight for me was that we, we, we don't connect with people in spite of our differences. We connect because of them. Yeah. I, lo I love that. And for those people who are listening rewind right here and just listen to that because in the world we live in how much would that one thought just help you to see the world differently and for some reason we've grown up in a world where we highlight differences and make them wrong and one of the reasons is like I wrote a book called The Mosaic and one of the reasons why I love the image, even though I don't use it, but I use it in the story that I tell, is that a mosaic's made up of all different size pieces, all different colors, all different shapes, all different textures. And it's that which gives it the totality of its being. All of them are just broken pieces. But together, when they come together with all the differences that they have, they make this exquisite artistry that can only be seen as something beautiful. Yeah. And I don't know why we can't get that as a world. So let's, let's segue a minute because I, I want to be, uh, like I could talk to you forever and, <laughs> and I love the way the conversation's going and I love your vulnerability and your honesty. Um, what brought you to magic? Why magic? So I got into magic just as a fact of being around it. My dad and my grandfather were magic, my dad and his father were magic enthusiasts. Neither of them ever did it professionally, but they loved magic. My grandfather was a, uh, a dentist uh, that uh, um, he built a very successful career. Uh, uh, he was actually, he, he's a veteran. He was a dentist and he was in the army and then he built his, his biz practice and did very, very well. And uh, so, uh, but he also, he was trained in hypnosis when hypnosis was first 
legalized for use in medicine. And so he has all these documented, like you can you know, like look up the documents where he would back in the early days, right, of dentistry. I mean, they, he's like, we didn't even wear gloves, you know, and you're wow. like, wow, you know, like you forget <laughs> right. how much has changed. Um, he, like, they didn't wear masks or anything. And he said, though, in those days, if you had, say, like, I, I might butcher this example, but say you had like a pregnant woman uh, who, who needed a root canal and she couldn't have anesthetic because they didn't have the technology or the medicine at the time to handle that. Well, he would use hypnosis to do to pull out a live root with no pain and no recollection. So wow. he used, so he was interested in uh, you know medical science, and that's how his brain worked. And so he was into magic. So my dad was into magic. My dad is is brilliant scientist, and people who are really smart, especially in the sciences, they have this. They get drawn to the ability to take something that you know is impossible, but make it feel real in spite of that. Like I yeah. I love what I love about magic. There's a lot of people that think magicians are trying to convince you that it's real. Most magicians aren't trying to convince you that it's real. The beauty of magic is not that you think it's uh, real. The beauty of magic is you know it's not, but all of your available evidence tells you it's happening anyway. And that rub, that, that I, I call it a conscious conflict between knowledge and evidence. Right, yeah. you have this this internal ah, like I know that's not possible, but I'm convinced it's happening. There's not a whole lot of things in life that do that to you, uh, and and none of them that do it on command. Magic, my mentor used to say this: magic is the only art form that produces wonder on command. Wow, beautiful. you can feel wonder. Yeah, and that's it's not my my mentor said that, but he he used to say like you can feel wonder from a double rainbow, you can feel wonder from a great musical or whatever, but they can't tell you. With act, they can't say here is when you will feel wonder, but yeah. we can tell you with perfect accuracy the moment you're going to feel the experience of wonder in a magic trick. Um, and so, yeah, so I was around magic all my life, and that you know, just so just as a as a matter of being around it, and my dad and grandfather used to give me magic kits and take me to magic shows and watch when the there were specials on uh, TV around Thanksgiving every year, and used to sit and remember when TVs were like. 10 inches and emitted heat and we used to just press our face me and my grandfather during thanksgiving and watch the magicians um and then he would help me uh, learn a card trick or two uh by ourselves and then after thanksgiving dinner i'd stand up for the whole family and my cousins and do the trick he had helped me learn and so i have these phenomenal memories associated with magic um and so yeah that's how i that's how i got into it and i think that also answered why yeah i'm interested in I I want to unpack something that you said just for clarity. Sure. Not, I love this idea that you that you believe mm. that you know from your experience that facts are facts. Make no mistake about it. There are real facts. Yeah, I, I don't. I I might question that myself, but that's mm -hmm. not the question I have. Okay, but it sort of is the question I have. Because how interesting that someone would, that would believe that facts are facts and there's nothing alter, alterable about the facts that exist would choose to see something real and provide evidence that it's not real, even though it is still real. Does that, does that, I mean, it's sort of like, yeah, your it's whole, interesting. does that mix with your mind a little bit of, yeah. of, yeah, and I, I can unpack that for you. So that that's I feel like that's one of those things that that feels when you first hear it like a contradiction that isn't when you unpack it, right? So yeah. So the I feel when I say facts are facts, I simply mean there are some things that are true and they're provably true. Uh, they can be provably true, uh, either kind of a priori, right? Just just one plus one is two, and I don't care how you conceive of that, right? It doesn't matter how you conceive of that, right? So there are things that are true simply by their definition right? All bachelors are unmarried men. It's true no matter what. So we have to agree to something, right? There are facts. And then there's observable facts that with complete certainty are true. And they can be debunked, but only by better facts, right? That's the problem, right? Only by better facts can we debunk stuff like that. So, uh, so, that, so we've got that. You can't create the feeling of wonder on command without having things that are absolutely true. 
Because if I didn't have a set of fundamental principles, there's nothing I could do to provoke your wonder. I can only provoke your wonder if you're convinced of a certain amount of things. And I've now shown you that those things you're convinced of are not holding in this moment. It's the reason you can't create magic for a kid. Now, people think that you can do magic for kids because he's kid magicians all over the place. Before about eight years old, magic doesn't work for kids. Seven or eight is when educational psychologists will tell you that kids develop a theory of mind, right? The uh, ability to understand other people's perspectives are different from theirs. And that's also when they start to understand that some things are and some things are not. If you try to do a magic trick for a four-year-old, they might smile if you're being goofy, but the trick itself, they don't really care. They'll look at you like, yeah, and you go, it's magic. And they go, well, of course it is. You said you were a magician. Right. Why wouldn't you be able to do magic? Right. Because they haven't yet figured out that some things aren't possible. If you show a kid a trick, they just go, I guess that's a thing that happens. And so within that context, I think you can understand maybe, uh, hopefully I'm making sense that there does have to be things that we've all agreed are fundamentally true and unalterable, inalterable. And within that context, I can provoke something in you that says, holy cow, I'm convinced that can't happen, but it, but it did. And we do it in service of that childlike feeling of wonder. And, and that's where the, the moral code of magicians kind of gets interesting, which is, you know, lying and deception, right? Magic is mostly deception, very little lying, but that's a conversation for another time. Mostly deception. Most places in life, we say deception is just inherently bad. But it's okay in a magic show. Why? Well, one, we've both agreed to the conditions. When you're watching a magician, you've entered into a world where the only way for you to watch a magician is to accept being deceived, right? So there's an implicit agreement with an audience, but there's also the, the, uh, the fact that we're doing it in service of a positive outcome, reminding yeah. an adult Right? Magic is best for adults because we're the ones that have forgotten how to um, see possibility and, and, and where there isn't any. Uh, kids so, still have that. So let me jump in a minute. Um, you're the magician, so you know, you know the theory behind it. You use the word deception, legal agreed upon deception with authority because that's what you believe magic is mm -hmm. my from a from a completely outsider's point of view i would use the word a change of perception rather than a deception mm. because what my basic starting ground is that there's nothing absolutely certain for a long time we thought the world was flat and there were sure. people that believed the world was flat for a long time we believed that white people were better than other colors of people. Sure. If you go around to people who are white supremacists, they'll say, this is a fact. Yeah, right? I'm just gonna interject real quick though. They, we believed the world was flat and, we, and people believed white people were superior be, for bad reasons. And that's, that's where skepticism is, like, is really important, right? It's not just believing things that are true, it's believing things that are true for the right reasons. You can believe a true thing for the wrong reasons and still be doing a, a disservice intellectually, right? You can just by chance believe something that's true, but for all the wrong reasons, that's, that's no good either. So, so uh, let me, let me back, back and forth sure. with you. Sure. Okay. Because what I'm wanting to try and do is use this as a segue to some of the things that you're doing and some of the things that I'm yep. doing now. Yep. yep. Okay. Because perceived reality is not reality. It's perceived reality. Mm -hmm. Everything right. that I wrote about in my book, the mosaic, was a boy who loses his parents two years apart and, and he yeah. asked the adults where his parents are and they say they're in a place called heaven. So yeah. this little boy goes out in search of the place called heaven, which he knows exists because that's what the adults told him. They told him there's a real place called heaven. And he sets out for that and the people that he meets along the way are not the rabbis and the priests and the swamis and the Sufis and the shamans and the medicine men or the magicians. Mm -hmm. They are they are common ordinary people. They're the homeless guy and the trash man and the juice man and the gardener and the and the waitress and the blind woman. And he meets them and he wonders why he's with them. And as soon as he starts to talk with them, and really more as soon as he starts to listen to them, he hears their story. 
and the person they become in his eyes completely changes from the one he first saw. It's to me the magic of, li- in this conversation, it would be the magic of truly listening. Mm-hmm. Because what you originally see disappears and vanishes because you see something else. Perception. And, and so in the world that we live in, we have people telling us what we believe we believe is bad or what we believe is wrong or what we believe is good or what if you believe this you're a good person and this is bad person but it depends what neighborhood you grow up in in a white supremacist world for instance or in a black lives matter world what they believe is good and right will be completely different and there there may be an altruistic over overbearing good and bad but not in that moment to those people and so what I think like is your, what I, what I'm doing with the connectivity of what I'm trying to do through this idea of a mosaic and putting the pieces of this world back together is to say what you believe is fine, but a change of perception, just take for a minute the possibility that this is possible. It isn't a deception. It's a change of perception. And how would that change your reality? If you would actually sit for 10 minutes, I sat with a homeless man in my first podcast. And I said, what would you, what's the one thing you would recommend to a world? Is this the world, the world you would love to to see and give over to your kids? And he said, no way. I said, what's the one thing you would like to, to tell people to do? He said, I wish people would take 10 minutes out of their life and sit with somebody they don't know and ask them how they're doing. Yeah. When someone did that to me, I was about to commit suicide that day. Mm. And I realized I couldn't do it because someone cared enough about me to ask how I am. Yeah. And so that isn't a deception. That's a change of perception. So what I really want to do is use this to segue to the work that you're doing now, which is using magic and see how the languaging of what you do in magic, because look, our thoughts create our words, our words create our stories, our stories create our life. If we change any one of those things, we have a completely different story, a completely different life, a completely yeah. different word pattern, completely yeah. different thought process. And I just wonder now, now, like we talked about as a kid, looking back, you know, everything looks different. I wish it was that easy to see it in those moments. It's not. Sure. How looking back on the way that you're living your life now and using what the magic of magic to connect people, to give people a vision of something they haven't seen would you now look back and maybe reconstruct or would you reconstruct? How would you look at it? Are there any changes you would make in the language that you used in your magic so that the magic of connection could become more connected? Are there changes I would have made in my magic? No. Are there changes that you would make in the way you talk about your magic now? that would allow it to easily bridge over to what you're doing now versus oh, sure. the thought that it's a deception. Well, I mean, I do use, I talk about magic at, at length cause I use it. That's my whole career now is built on using magic as a metaphor um, for taking on different perspectives from your own and bridging the gap and creating something extraordinary, you know, in, in the middle of all these different viewpoints. And, and I talk about emotional perspective and, and all these sorts of things. Um, you know, tactical empathy, all the things that go into doing magic and uh, doing it well. Uh, I mean, magic as an art form, I, I wouldn't, if I'm talking about magic on its own, I mean, there is fundamentally a deception just, just, just at its core. It's just, that is, if I lead you to a false belief, uh, if I intentionally lead you to a false belief, that is a deception. That is, and I don't know if you can tell right now, but my my degree and what I abandoned my PhD on is philosophy of language. So mm-hmm. this this is kind of the core. And I think language, like sometimes people go, ah, it's just, it's just semantics. And it's like, yeah. no, 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 it's all semantics. Right. Right. That that's semantics is the study of meaning. It's like, no, 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 <laughs> the words matter. It's like you just said, your words. You know, like Wittgenstein said famously, the limits of my language mean the limits of my world. He didn't mean your, your vocabulary. He yeah. meant the way you talk about the world is the way you can conceive the world. Yeah. Um, and so when you expand and change and alter the way you talk about the world, like just changing your own title, it, this is so powerful. When you, uh, so 
someone who was a hero and I'm now very lucky to call a mentor and maybe even a friend is, uh, is Seth Godin, the, the, the father of modern marketing and business legend. And he's been very, very kind to me and very, um, just very supportive of my work. Uh, he, he talks a lot about, um, he calls himself a teacher. And he said, what would it be if instead of calling your customers, customers or clients, what if you called them your students? How would you change your approach? How would you change your marketing copy? How would you change your, right, your conversation? Yeah. Just by changing the way you, you, if you call yourself a teacher instead of a consultant, say, you're going to move through the world differently. So our language really matters. Um, so just in that way, magic, I deliberately lead you to a false belief. I knowingly lead you to, to believe something that isn't true, just for a moment, right? For the sake of a greater service. Now, that aspect of magic has very little to do with my work in connection. What my work in connection has to do with is the fact that as a magician, you're working through these completely different perspectives. And in order for me to create that moment for you, I can create the same moment for you as this person and that person, but I might have to get there in a different way. And I have to get there in a different way related to how you see the world. Because if I just try to do it via the way I see the world, there's no telling, there's no guarantee that I'm going to be able to get you to a new point of view. Because I don't know what your point of view is. If I'm trying to create magic, I need to get you to a new place. And that's why I said you can't fool a magician. Because right. they've got the same point of view. To fool a magician, you need to do something really weird. And we call these magician foolers. You need to do things that have no deception and you fool magicians because they're expecting mm -hmm. deception. It's, it's the same idea. In order to produce that feeling, I need to really understand where you're coming from and what you believe. Because, and this is, a, this is another Seth-ism that I'll throw out there. He, you know, he says this all the time. When you're confused how somebody sees the world or confused by a decision that they've made, they made a decision or did something that you don't agree with, ask yourself, what do they know, what do they believe, and what do they want? Because chances are, if you believed what they believed and you wanted what they wanted, you would have done the same thing. Hmm. The problem is you don't believe what they believe and you don't want what they want. And if you can find that difference, and this is where it relates to me to magic, if you can find where we have a different belief or a different desire, then you can create something amazing. You can create something mm -hmm. extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So a lot of, so reconcile for me magic to the world that you live in now. Why do you even use magic in the world that you live in now? Because the world that I perceive you live in now, and I'm asking you how you perceive it, is that you are not deceiving people into connection. You, right. are, you, are, you are offering connection to people for them to choose. How does magic, which is at its very heart and soul, the resolution of a deception, mm -hmm the cause of a deception to, re to resolve, to create the amazement, fit into a world that is sick of deception, that doesn't want to be mm -hmm. deceived, that deception takes away from connection. How do those overlap? I was trying yeah. to lead you to that place through a different set of language, <laughs> but you didn't want to go there. So I want to know where you want to go and how you do it. So the, the boring answer is I, the way that I reconcile is I use magic as, as, a, as a speaker and as a workshop presenter as a way to actually give my attendees um, a, a concrete example, a fun, memorable, visual, visceral, concrete example of the things I'm talking about so that they're much more likely to remember what I'm teaching them by attaching it to something that was visceral and fun and, uh, and emotional, right? So that's the boring answer is it's, it's a, I use magic now as a means to an end where when I was a magician, I used it as the end in, in itself. Um, and, I, and I see magic as a greater service. It's better for me in service of this end 
than it was when it was an end in itself. That may not have been true 50 or 100 years ago when the world was a very different place. But now it's, as you said, people are not only sick of deception. Well, see, I don't know if I agree with that. I think people say they're sick of deception, okay. but then they deceive themselves and each other on a daily basis all the time. And you only have to be on social media to understand that. Totally. So I'm not sure they are sick of deception. I think they want to say they're sick of deception and then continue on deceiving themselves. Um, and we do it. I do it too, right? We are all in these silos and these bubbles and it's getting harder. The problem with the way the digital revolution has gone is originally you had to choose to put yourself in a bubble. Now we're being put in bubbles and we don't even know it. Yep. We don't recognize that we're in a bubble. You think what you're seeing on the internet is what everybody else is seeing. But there's a very good chance that if you and your friend and that person over there all did a Google search for the exact same thing, you would get three completely different totally. results totally. and have no idea. Totally. So the deception is everywhere. And in that way, I think using magic, which is a way that we experience deception for fun, just like we experience deception in a movie for fun or at a Broadway play for fun, right? There's all these different ways. A, a video game is a deception, right? right? We're not upset about these things. Right. But if I can use magic to unravel it and show you, but here's what we can do once we understand what the core is, when we have the core, which is the goal isn't to deceive in order to, to con someone, right? That's a con artist, not a magician. The goal is to deceive in service of creating a shared experience that's extraordinary, that brings us back to possibility. We can do that in our conversations, in our day-to-day -day interactions, and just leave out the deception. We don't need that. We just need so So stay with me, because I love this. And, 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 and I, <laughs> I feel you here. And I love this conversation, because it's really real, and it's really exactly what I was hoping for. Because the way you perceive the world is different than the way that I perceive the world. And this is where real innovation happens. This is where real understanding happens. If we can get out of our belief system enough to embrace and listen to another belief system, which mm -hmm. is what I want to do with you, to listen to what you're saying, hear what you're saying. But at the core of what I hear, is the deception is entertaining the deception gives an enjoyment the deception gives a wonderment but the deceptions is just a deception and so there's another place where true connection that has no deception in it that is the antithesis mm -hmm. of deception has a wonderment and an excitement and the joy that is actually at the far other angle of that. So if we if we want to create a connection that is free of deception, and I believe you, people deceive our, we deceive ourselves all the time. I'm not even going to say people, I'm going to say me. Yeah. You know, I I deceive myself all the time thinking sure, that this is the way it is, thinking that yeah. okay. And we all do. Yep. But if we're looking for that place where and I know you felt this. I and and I and I'm I I'm inviting my listeners to take a moment to to know if you feel this that moment where there is a pure connection, where there is no deception, where everything you thought about what a person was thinking, feeling, meaning they were, you thought maybe they were trying to be nice to you just because they wanted something from you. But that moment where it clicked, where you knew that they were being genuinely kind, genuinely interested, genuinely involved, and there was no deception in it. That excitement and that feeling and that and that belief and that hope and that regeneration of what we believe and that reperception of something we perceived is such a breath of fresh air. And I believe where you are right now and the work that you're doing with people, just from the vibration that we had in our conversation and your openness even to me, pushing you back on this conversation is that you're at that place also where you wanted where you want to bring people to a deceptionless place of real connection. Yeah. Why I, bring deception in? It's well, like, I don't. I I we were talking about magic when originally I talked about that we were really just we were talking about magic as an art form in and of itself and and the fundamental that's why I brought that up and 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 it's just in and of itself the only way to Fool someone, which is what magic is. If you're not fooled, you haven't experienced magic, right? And in, in as a as a 
as a 21st century art form, not, not magic, the word that people are, the magic of this and the magic, not that. I'm talking right. about magic as an art form. Magician right. on stage doing tricks to, you know, for an audience. Deception is fundamental, but the, the way that I talk about it in my presentations, in my book, in my blog, in my podcast, and all these places is the core question of magic is how do I, how do I create a positive, uplifting experience between me and an audience where we all leave transformed for the better in an art form that is fundamentally antagonistic? I know something you don't know right? This is the core problem of magic. It's really easy to fool someone. It's very hard to make them enjoy being fooled. Mm. And so, so the, the, the job of a magician, yeah, the job, the core job of a magician is to find a way to, within the context of fooling someone, give them a positive experience that is uplifting and transformative. And that is, the way to do that is to create a meaningful connection with the audience. And when we take that into our lives and our conversations and our day-to-day -day interactions, the deception that there's no part, there's no part in that. That's, that's how magicians overcome it. That's how I, I learned to overcome that with connection. I just take connection and teach that. Okay. Being the wordsmith you are, humor me <laughs> for one minute. Define for me the difference between deception and, and perception. Because what I, I think at the core of my question to you is not being a magician, being a lay person, not knowing anything about magic. And I feel idiotic asking a, you know, a, a, a magician. Not at all. Not um, at all. Really what I believe a magician does or what I believed he did before this conversation, which I love how, that you're, you're here with me, is I believe that he allowed me to perceive a reality that I thought was real in a different reality for a moment that made me question whether what I believed was real. It wasn't a deception. It was a re-perception re of something. And in that, if I were to use that language, I would then be able to take the world, that world into the world that I work in, which is we perceive people to be a certain way. We might perceive them to be not as smart as us or not as intelligent or because they're a Democrat or a Republican, they don't have the right way to do it. But if we can take, if we can create a moment where we can allow them to re-perceive what it is, and it comes from a, maybe more knowledge in an area. That's what a teacher does in a classroom. They take perceptions of what we think and change them because of there's more knowledge. Why does it have to be a deception? Why is magic so confirmed on this thought that I have to deceive you rather than I have to re-perceive you? I just think they're two completely different concepts. And I, and I think that the curiosity in this conversation is mostly about the fact that you're using deception as a metaphor and I'm not. So uh, I when you. I say deception, I mean, if I take, uh, I don't know, if I grab a, 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 a whole piece I, of string and make a whole, it look right, like if a I grab, three strings. If I grab something off the table, whatever is near you right now, if I grab a little, if there's a, if we're at a restaurant, I grab a sugar packet off the table, crumple it up and put it in my left hand and you believe it's in my left hand, but in fact, it's not. I've pretended to put it in my left hand. There's nothing in there. My hand is closed. The people watching this on video can see this. If, they, if you now believe that that sugar packet is in my left hand, I have deliberately led you to a false belief. Right. Now, at the moment when I open my hand and show you there's nothing there, <gasps> right? Okay, so if you genuinely believed that it was in my hand and I open it up and show you it's gone, you will have a real reaction. Now, if you think you're on to me and whatever, you won't, right? Because then you haven't been fooled at all. Right. You must, I must deceive you to produce that moment of wonder. I have to. Because if you believed what I was actually doing was true, whatever, if you knew what I was actually doing, there would be no moment of wonder because you'd be like, gotcha. well, I'm gotcha. not impressed. There's nothing. So I'm just using it as, as a, a, pure concept not as a metaphor for anything and i think that might be where uh, i think you're right we're getting a, a little great, bit i think that's a great yeah. point yeah um 
Uh, for what it's worth, though, I haven't had that much fun in a conversation in a long time. That Because usually when I come on podcasts and when I run my own, we have the conversations that you expect to have about how people's careers moved and all this stuff. And uh, I haven't gotten to flex like my philosophy muscle like yeah. in a long time in a conversation. So thank you for that. That was oh, enjoyable. Uh, I, and thank you for going there with me because the whole purpose of this is for people to be a fly on the wall and hear how minds think and how people perceive. Yeah, and how, and, but and you've, you've really got me thinking about, about I'm going to have to keep thinking about that now because yeah. I, I had not thought about it in that way. So thank you for that. You're, you're so welcome. Um, we've hinted at what you do now, but take a moment and tell us what you do now so that people can can... Like if they're as intrigued by this conversation, I can't imagine that they won't be flocking to your websites, which I'm going to have in show notes. But tell us what you actually do right now. Yeah. So what what I what I do is I I kind of made it up for myself, but it, it fits within. We need a better term for this industry. The industry I'm in is thought leadership, which is ridiculous because when someone says, "What do you do?" I can't go. I'm a thought leader. Um, like talk about ego, right? Right. Uh, we need a better term. So essentially, what I am is I'm a, I'm a writer uh, and a, oh, I, I, like, I hesitate to even call myself a writer. What I do is I spend all day, every day, thinking about, talking about, researching, and, and considering the topic of human connection and how it relates to many different fields, healthcare and customer service and marketing and uh, personal development, right? all these different areas. I'm concerned with human connection as an umbrella. Now, what do I do with human connection? I write it on my weekly blog. I wrote an entire book about it. I'm writing another book related to it in a different way. I run a podcast. I have a YouTube channel. I'm taking my thoughts about human connection and putting them in as many different possible mediums as I can. So however you like to collide with ideas, you can. So I want to make it easy. If you're the kind of person like short form, uh, I got a weekly blog. Sign up for my blog, get an email every week. It takes you five minutes to read it. It gets you thinking a little bit differently about something in human connection. If you're not into short form, but you like audio, I got a podcast, right? If you like visual, I got a YouTube channel. If you So how do I actually make a living though? I make a living from the 20 or 30 times a year when a lovely organization, often big international corporations, but just as often I work with healthcare and education. I'm actually very passionate about working with uh, patient experience in healthcare, a lot of keynote, a lot of those conferences. And um, I work a lot with educators in high school and college. Not, I do some work with students themselves. In the fall, I do a very inspirational version of my talk for incoming uh, college students. But most of my work is done for the educators that work with students about yeah. educational environments. And what I do is I give talks and workshops and consulting and coaching to help people build an environment where everyone feels heard, understood, and valued. Bam. That's what I do. Bam. That's what you do. You forget about thought leader. That's what you do. And that, yeah. I mean, that's where we resonate because that's what I'm about to do as well. Yeah. Um, as much as I would love to continue, I want to be honored to your time. I'm all right. Uh, uh, and I love this conversation. I hope it'll be the beginning of many conversations that we have um, because it challenged me to think beyond the way that I see the world also. And you helped me clarify terms and, and, and understandings. And I so appreciate that. And it's the beauty of conversation. It's the beauty of connection. It's the beauty of listening. It's the beauty of challenging, but then not challenging and holding on to your belief, but listening. That conversation would have never happened in a Facebook thread or a text message. Totally. It has to be this kind of connection. Um, when you look at the world, you look out your window and you see the world that we live in. Is this the world you always dreamed of handing over to ch your children and your children's children? No. No. <laughs> okay. Um, what is it that, what's one thing that you would like to see changed? What's one thing that you feel would move the needle more in the direction of becoming that world? What's one thing people could do? So what I believe people could do, and I'm not apocalyptic about this. There's a lot of folks in my industry 
who talk in much more dire terms. I actually think we're on the precipice of the best time ever in in humanity. Um, I think we're dealing with a lot of, we're going through these growing pains and you're seeing it play out in politics and all this stuff across the world right now. Um, but I think what the digital, I think the net sum of the digital revolution is very positive. And the reason I think that is, yes, it's created this issue where we have to deal with silos and it's easier to just yell at someone angrily, not obviously online. We're, 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 the technology went faster than we adapted it safely into our lives, but we're working that out. That'll get worked out over the next 10 years. You're already seeing young people start to give up their phones, not give them up, but young people aren't on their phones right now the way that they were 10 years ago because it's not new technology anymore. They're, they're, you're, you feel this backlash happening right now to all the tech, which is this, you feel people are begging for something real again. They're just, you can feel it in, the, in, in, in your conversations and on the street and at work and online. People are desperate for human connection. And I think the young people right now Generation Z and the ones behind them, younger than them, there are, they are and they're going to be, I truly believe, the most empathetic, the kindest generation the world has ever seen. And it's actually because of technology, because the best part of the digital revolution is it put every human being on planet Earth one step away from each other. And so you get a six, seven, eight-year-old kid now that's on the internet and playing their favorite game. They're going to be in a chat room with all the other kids that are playing that game and they're all talking and communicating. They're not thinking about the fact that this person's over in Japan and this one's in Africa and this one's in North Korea mm -hmm. and this one's in... They're going, I like this game and they like this game. And so we are connecting over the fact that we like this game. And I think what that's doing is producing an entire generation that's going to take over in 15 or 20 years from now who really are seeing past all the cultural stuff. Not saying it doesn't matter. Of course it matters. But saying it doesn't affect my ability to connect with you. And again, like I said earlier, that we can connect not in spite of those differences, but precisely because of them. Yeah. And so what I would say is, what we can do, what you can do, what anybody in your life can do, what you can teach to your kids or the neighborhood kid if you don't have your own, is teach people to recognize others' humanity, to show up on a daily basis with generosity and respect, learn to look people in the eye and say, I hear you, I see you, and I'm still here for you even if we don't always see eye to eye. Yeah, that's how I define kindness, and I think that's what we need more of. And I think it's happening anyway. But we can we can push that revolution forward. So do me a favor, craft that down to five words for people who are more simple, because I believe everything you said. I want a simple mantra. That I got six can, words. Can okay. I do six? Absolutely, six is perfect. Every person you meet is important. Beautiful. Beautiful. Um, if people want to find out more about you, obviously we're going to have that all in the show notes, but give it, give a shout out to how's the best way that people can reach you. Sure. The best way is humanconnection.blog. So not.com, but dot blog, humanconnection.blog. Once you're there, toss an email in, get all the freebies, great resources, and you'll get access to my weekly blog and the community that I'm building right now online. Um, and once you're there, you'll see a link to my podcast if you're interested in that and my book and all those other things. The, everything I have is free except for the book. The book, I, mean, you know, you know, I don't make any money. So you know, you have a book. You don't make any money selling a book. Um, I would give it away for free if it didn't cost me money to produce it. So everything I do is free. The book, I'm sorry, not the, the blog, the podcast, the YouTube channel, all my socials. You can reach out to me anytime I respond to every single person that reaches out to me as quickly as I can. <laughs> Fabulous. So thank you so much for giving your time, which is probably the most valuable asset we have mm -hmm. to be with us today, to talk to the family of people that listen to this Mosaic podcast. 
And I just want to take a moment and sort of highlight something, if I can, from my perspective in summary. Um, some of the things that happen are not the things we predict are going to happen. But as they happen, they're so perfectly suited for what we really are trying to say. One of the things that I loved about our conversation together was the fact that you and I pushed each other on belief systems a little bit, right? Yeah. But it was done with an honor and a dignity. It was done with a understanding. It was done with a desire that left both of us saying, gosh, I want to think about that more because yeah. you brought something to light for me that I haven't thought about. I had fun in this conversation, right? Conversations where we disagree do not have to be conversations where we fight and argue. <laughs> yes. Right? Yes. They yes. can be conversations where we, ex <laughs> where we explore and we understand. And if we think about where innovation lies, it's not in thinking the same things we always thought or talking to the people that always think like us. It's in that place where unlike minds come together and allow each other the freedom to express what it is they believe. And for those of you who know me, I'm about to set out on a year-long trip around the U.S. and then a lifelong trip around the world to sit with people who haven't had that opportunity or feel that the world around them doesn't tr isn't trustworthy enough for them to be able to share what they believe. And, and in a world where we can't say what we actually think, how will we ever become a connected reality? Because we're just living in silos that are make pretend worlds. So I want to film it and I want to create a docu-series or a documentary that will be, become the voice of the voiceless. And those aren't just the poor and the mistrodden and those people that nobody thinks about. It's the person that's running a company that says, I can't, uh, it's lonely at the top because yeah. I can't really show myself. It's the employees in the company that say, if I say what I really believe, I'll be ex excommunicated because there isn't a level of trust that's built amongst us. It's the mother who says to their kids, you don't talk to me anymore because you don't like, I feel like you're drifting away. It's the wife who says to the husband, you're not listening to me. Like I'm trying to say something to you and you're not hearing me. We are all experiencing a cataclysm of unheardness. I don't know if that's a word or not, but I'm making it up. It ought to be. It ought to be, right? <laughs> and, and that unheardness is limiting our, our way to contribute and be a part of this world. So, like, listen to what Brian said. Take a moment and just have a human connection. Reach out to somebody who, for no reason at all, but just for the reason of the joy of what happens, when two people actually spend a moment to say, who are you? That to me is what this Mosaic podcast is all about. It's the opportunity to meet perfect or imperfect strangers, people who believe like me or don't believe like me. And just to share a different perspective on the same world that we see, to broaden and enlarge and, and, and make it make it richer and deeper and full of more, more value. And so for that, I thank you, the listener, for taking your time to spend with us. And I thank Brian for taking his time to share with us his perspective. And I hope all of you will get in touch with him. I hope all of you will reach out. I hope all of you will bring him to your companies, to your communities, to your schools, to your medical places, wherever it is, mm -hmm. to allow him the opportunity to help you see a world that you never saw before. For those of you who know me, I look forward to inviting you back to the next podcast, to the next possibility, for the next per a perception. And I honor and thank you and so respect you for your time. And with that, I say, Mosaic out. Ciao.